And so when I read The Coddling of the American Mind by Haidt and Lukianoff, and then I read Lukianoff's book, The Canceling of the American Mind, the parts of it that were the most fun for me were the ones where, oh, God, Keith, you do that. And I'm going to talk about that more later because that was the most fun part because those things caused me to instantaneously change certain perspectives that I felt gave me a broader perspective. Like this thing about, I think that it's, this is a really good thing that all this mess is happening with DEI and all this other stuff because it's pushing green to break through into teal. And we're having various people coming out with essentially teal perspectives. There's this 29-year-old black kid named, what's his name? Uh, Coleman Hughes. Coleman Hughes is a force of nature. Wrote a book called The End of Racial Politics. And I call him a kid. He's 29. Look, I'm 73. I can affectionately call Coleman Hughes a kid. This kid is just, I love this kid. I love him. Yeah. He said, look, you know, I had a really great life as a black guy and I'm having a good time at Columbia and I'm surrounded by people who just say they're getting microaggressed every day. And he said, I'm kind of sick of it. He said he wants to arrange social help according to socioeconomic level. I think, yeah, I've been saying that for years. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. This is one of the complaints that red states have. You know, how come you're not helping us? We're poor and they are. I just want to make a real brief comment, Keith, because I think you said something really insightful that I've been thinking about a lot is every one of those letters, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, every one of those is itself part of a larger polarity. Right? Okay, so good. we can look at diversity in polarity with something like unity. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we know about these polarities is if you skew too far one direction or the other, if one pole becomes dissociated from the other, things fall apart. So okay. that's why something like diversity, if you have too much emphasis on diversity, that can actually lead to new sources of cultural fragmentation, for example, if that is not properly aligned with some kind of unity. Same thing with equity. Equity, you know, equal outcomes, for example, is often put in polarity with something like equal opportunities. And there's a very important tension that we can get into or not between those two. And same with inclusion. Inclusion is always in polarity with exclusion. And guess what, guys? There are healthy forms of exclusion and there are unhealthy forms of inclusion. So this Hold is up. why I think, you know, the polarity thinking really brings a missing piece to these discussions that we have to take into account because it gives so much explanatory power for how a lot of these movements have gone completely off the rails. Well, because they're working with disintegrated polarities. Practically speaking, when they've done research about teaching diversity in high schools, it actually creates more racism in high schools. So what research tells us is that people have to feel unified first. Right. And from a position of being unified, exploring individual differences then becomes a deepening of intimacy. Anybody that's ever been in a, in a group, women's group, a men's group, therapy group, and so on, if you think about it, first the group creates a sense of inclusion. Here we all are, shared in this container of a, us together with a common purpose. And then as everybody is anchored in that, you start discovering all the delicious differences in everybody's experience, which widens everybody's consciousness. But you have to have that sense first. So the organizing principle around all this stuff is freedom of speech. There's a reason that it was the First Amendment. There's a reason that that was the first right that was written in. Why was that? Jefferson said, I would rather have a free press and no government than a government and no free press. You know, he realized that. We're talking about these stages as they emerge sort of vertically right? There's the vertical qualities of each of these stages. But there's a missing piece here that I think often gets overlooked, which is that each of these stages, once they emerge, they also kind of cascade into culture and society, not as a vertical stage, but as a horizontal type, right? In other words, green emerges 
it produces artifacts, it produces positions, it produces ideas, and those artifacts, positions, and ideas can then be consumed by anyone, anywhere they happen to be in their own development. So you get lots of cases where people are taking, people who are at themselves, say an amber stage of development, but they identify more with sort of the type of rhetoric that comes out of the left, much of which is sort of grounded in, at least originally, some healthy green ideas and yes, distinctions and so forth. And then those distinctions get sort of downsampled, right? They get downsampled so that people at previous stages can engage with those ideas. And they don't always engage with them. In fact, they seldom engage with those ideas the way they were originally intended because they themselves don't have the the cognitive sort of capacities to enact those ideas properly. I think what's important here is to remember that much of what we consider to be cancel culture isn't actually coming from green. It's coming from like red or amber enactments. of Exactly. Green, right? So the first hypothesis that I want to make is that over the last 10 or 15 years, really ever since the innovation of the smartphone, when all of us are basically carrying the internet around with us in our pocket, we have seen a skew away from centralization, which was how the previous media systems were largely organized. You had network news, you had, you know, you had these trusted anchors who were interpreting and communicating information for people, et cetera. It was a much more centralized model to what we have today, which is a completely decentralized model where every individual in the system is responsible for curating their own informational terrain. And I think that that produces a larger quantity of information altogether, but also sort of a lower quality of information. Because now what you've done is you've taken this mode of discourse, which was being, for the most part, was being managed by really orange stage into maybe some green, but for the most part, it was it was orange. And so our mode of discourse hovered around that orange stage. Rational. As soon as we hyper decentralized our media systems, that mode of discourse went down because guess what? Now everyone has a smartphone in their pocket. Now everyone is both contributing to and curating their own informational feeds. And by the way, 70% of the world happens to be pre-rational. So what's that going to do to the mode of discourse? It's going to lower that mode of discourse. And I think cancel culture, things like cancel culture emerge in that ecosystem, right? It's almost like a defense mechanism that the collective is taking around this regression we're seeing because decentralization allows all sorts of regressive voices and narratives to come through and to find traction in a way that they couldn't in the previous more centralized media system. It's a form of so splitting. It's splitting, Corey, like we talked about. Is a, it is exactly, it is splitting both in an individual and on a collective basis. Yes. That is absolutely right. It is a form of splitting. And it's a defense mechanism that yes. a lot of people are engaging with completely unconsciously. They just want to stave off sort of the irrationality that they see flooding into our informational networks, right? That's their intent, but they're taking very illiberal. They themselves, it's almost like fight fire with fire yeah. or an eye for an eye leaves the entire world blind. And what that does when we are so awash in this sort of skewing towards decentralization, that brings us to another polarity, which is the one that we've already mentioned, the one between inclusion and exclusion. Mm -hmm. And let me share these maps really, really briefly. So... Here's the first polarity I was talking about. And for those who don't know, we actually now have a polarity section on integral life, which you can find in this resources section. It's got a couple dozen of these polarity maps. I'm adding to them every single week. And I just find them very, very helpful in terms of creating sort of guardrails for a lot of these. These are great. I always learn something new. Even if it's some that is my, one of my areas, I always learn something new from these maps. I really encourage everybody just to check them out. You'll be surprised. I'm glad you say so, man. So we can see oh, that yeah. with, you know, centralization and decentralization, there are positives associated with each and there are negatives associated with each. And when it comes to polarity thinking, the positives come from when the two poles more or less have basic alignment with each other. And 
the negative qualities emerge when these two poles become overly dissociated from each other. So we can see that the positives of centralization are things like, you know, quality control, a more coherent discourse, the capacity to create shared reality between people, the capacity to manage crisis in an efficient and effective way. However, when centralization gets decoupled from decentralization, we get things like, well, what we're talking about right now, the risk of censorship, the risk of monopolization and manipulation and manufacturing consent. And then over on the decentralization, you know, the positives are pretty obvious. We get a wider diversity of pr perspectives, wider engagement among the population, rapid dissemination of information, and the opportunity for alternative narratives to kind of come in and exert a little bit more influence than they could under a totally centralized system. But the negatives of decentralization, when you have too much of it, a pathological degree, that brings us into information overload when we have an overwhelm of high quantity and low quality content it brings in misinformation and propaganda and conspiracy myths and these really are for the most part mythologies these very elaborate mythologies that are being constructed around a particular you know theory or idea of how the world works and now i'm just constellating data points in a very almost Rorschachian way into these mythologies, these very elaborate mythologies that allow me to perpetuate my beliefs, no matter how irrational they might be. It leads to fragmentation, a total breaking apart of the shared reality that we used to feel with each other and the loss of curation. Individuals now have to, like I was saying earlier, now have to curate their own informational sort of territories. So we can see that, you know, there are positive and negatives associated with all of this, with both of these poles. And when we lapse too far into decentralization, that makes us grapple with this polarity, inclusion and exclusion. Yeah. And again, I want to make the point that you can have unhealthy versions of inclusion and you can have healthy versions of exclusion. And then we have one of the core bedrock principles of integral thinking itself, which is this principle of non-exclusion. Yes. And I've always loved that Ken chose that phrase. He didn't use the word inclusion. He used non-exclusion. That's right. And what does non-exclusion mean? It means everybody is right, asterisk with an important caveat. And that caveat is everyone is right, assuming that everyone is staying in their zone in terms of whatever methodologies they're using, disclosing some aspect of reality and not projecting those conclusions onto other aspects of reality that they're not equipped to talk about. So an integral non-exclusion, for example, would not include physicists who are, you know, maybe trying to undermine consciousness itself or saying that... Talking about you know, biology. Physicists all, talking yeah, about yeah, biology. All psychological states are just, you know, physical reactions that are taking yeah, place. Yeah. Or what have you, right? We don't include those kinds of... We include the territory, we include the reality, we include the methodologies, but we don't include all the conclusions. Sort of like from an integral point of view, we include people's values at each of these stages, but we don't include their views, right? Well, well Ken said, so it's non-exclusion and enfoldment, okay? Right, that's the second step. The second step. So how does it, practically speaking, what is enfoldment? And, and enfoldment is, if you want to do it, it's engaging in the dialectic. It's right. people open to influence and being influenced, looking for deeper truth that will naturally lead them wider, deeper, farther. So that's why it wasn't just non-exclusion. He had to include enfoldment. And what was the third one? Enactment. If you want to know this, do that. Walk the walk. So don't. That's right. One, yes, it's not exclusion. Two, you need to be able to engage in the dialectic. And three... If you don't embody your principles, then essentially you're neglecting the collective.